I'm Ronald, the Rules Lawyer, and today I'll be giving an overview of the new document, the second document, released by Wizards of the Coast for One D&D, the sixth edition of D&D, and also talk about 20 things you probably missed when going over the document yourself. Uh, first, to introduce myself, I am a lawyer, and I game master pathfinder second edition mostly i've also run dnd fifth edition and enjoyed it and i've also taught kids uh, you can go over my history in my channel wrap on my channel uh in my previous videos uh my previous lawyers critique videos i have been giving my thoughts on the direction of one dnd for this next document i can't do it all in one video and so it's really big and so I'm going to be releasing this video first, which will give describe what's in it and things you might have missed. And for the second video, I'll save my critique of it in which I will go over uh, my thoughts of the overall direction, uh, whether this is a new edition, whether they have started doing what I would call a real playtest, uh, try to unbury their design goals, talk about the issue that I'm already seeing flaring up on some of the uh, discussion boards about martial caster disparity, discuss the tension in the document between protecting the niche of classes and giving player characters freedom to customize their characters and the problems that that tension poses, the fact that ability score increases still compete directly with feats, the lack of unique class spells, talk about epic boons and then talk about widely recognized problems that mostly GMs or DMs have had with D&D 5th edition that one D&D is trying to address and those that they have not begun to address. If you're interested in my thoughts on any of those topics, subscribe, uh, you'll get and ring the bell for the notification for when that video comes out. Before going into the 20 things you probably missed, I'll give an overview of the content of the document and I'll make some observations which may be new to you still, so still worth watching. The first change uh, is that they are grouping the classes into four class groups. They are warrior, priests, mages, and experts. And this document covers, has previews of the three classes that are experts, which are bard, ranger, and rogue. The document suggests that when making an adventuring party that you can pick one class from each group, which I don't think is necessarily true. There doesn't seem to be a, a clear division of traditional combat roles between the four. For example, the bard here has significant healing abilities and is grouped with what is usually regarded as a striker, the rogue. And a bard does not necessarily complement a priest class as much as a rogue does. Rather, the significance of the grouping seems to be something else. Uh, first, the expert has a signature feature, which is expertise, which was previously exclusive to bards and rogues and lets you add double your proficiency bonus on selected skills. And that is now extended to the ranger. And each of these previews has expertise given at a low level and then at one of the mid levels. But the more significant part about class groups is how other rules in the system will refer to them. And in this document, we now see how feats, some of them will be exclusive to one or more class groups. This reminds me of Pathfinder 2nd Edition, which gives you the opportunity to choose many feats, including feats that are exclusive, not to your class group, but to your specific class. Uh, this I'll comment more on in the second video. When discussing the classes, I will go in detail comparing them to the 5e version. The first class is the Bard. They get expertise, the ability to get double the proficiency bonus with two skills uh, at level one and with two more skills at level nine. Then they are proficient only with simple weapons. This is a change. They, there was a handful of other weapons that they were proficient with in 5e. And we are seeing a full move away from bards being what they traditionally were in D&D, &D, some kind of jack of all trades that included some martial ability, to being full casters in their own right. The bard, instead of having its own class spell list, has access to the arcane spell list, but only four of the eight schools, namely divination, enchantment, illusion, and transmutation. 
Significantly, bards are now prepared spellcasters and can choose different spells in the morning, just like wizards do. Jeremy Crawford, in his interview, said that they want to encourage players to try out more the spells that are uh, not immediately obviously useful for combat, uh, and that also to have the flexibility to adapt to adventuring days that may not have as much to combat. It's uh, an interesting change and makes me think that sp uh, spontaneous uh, spellcasting classes that are limited to specific what spells they know uh, may be gone. Bards are now being given more support to be healers for the party by being guaranteed abilities that do not compete with other resources such as spell slots. The level second ability, Songs of Restoration, gives them spells that they always have prepared that do not count against the spells that they can prepare, just like cleric domain spells in 5th edition. Additionally, Bardic Inspiration has been changed. There's now a way to heal characters in the middle of combat using Bardic Inspiration. Also significantly, Bardic Inspiration is not something you hand out to somebody as a bonus action that they must use within the next 10 minutes. Now it is something that can be used as a reaction to try to swing a failure into a success, one failure by your ally within 60 feet. And then uh, they can roll that die and add it to their failed check. Additionally, it can be used as a reaction when an ally takes damage and you roll that same die to heal them that amount. So it can bring somebody up who has just been knocked out. Significantly, the number of bardic inspiration has kind of been reduced for low levels. It used to be your charisma modifier, but now it's your proficiency bonus. And I'll say that uh, I understand the switch to proficiency bonus. It's something that scales up as you level up naturally. It's a consistent mechanic, but it doesn't have to be proficiency bonus plus zero. <laughs> I think uh, having two uses per long rest is probably too stingy uh, for my tastes. In fact, Font of Inspiration, the fifth level ability that lets you get your Bardic Inspiration back on a short rest, has been moved up from fifth level to seventh level. So making this early period of having to really ration your Bardic Inspiration longer. Font of Bardic Inspiration, although moved up from fifth level to seventh level, has a slight buff in that if the ally who rolls your Bardic Inspiration die rolls a one, you're not considered having spent that die. You can use it later. There's a nice emphasis on helping new players by giving suggestions of spells that a bard player can prepare. Counter Charm has been removed as a class feature. The bard gains its subclass at third level and gets new abilities at sixth level, 10th level, and 14th level. The level 11 ability, Magical Secrets, has been buffed be um, in accord with their shift to being prepared spellcasters. Now they choose one spell list, and in the morning they get they have the option of using some of their preparation slots to prepare spells from that list, and they're not limited to the four magical schools. So they can choose the arcane list, for example, or uh, divine or primal. And at level 15, they get to choose a second list that they can prepare spells from. So they truly are becoming the can cast from any tradition class. For every class, the level 20 capstone ability has been moved down to level 18. In this case, uh, the bard gains two uses of bardic inspiration when rolling initiative instead of one before. What now happens at level 20 for every class is that they get to choose one epic boon, which themselves are feats, which I'll get into later. This document also features one subclass for each of the three classes featured. And in this case, for the bard, it is the College of Lore, which now gives you at level three, instead of a free choice of three skills, it gives you uh, Arcana, History, and Nature. If you already have one of those skills, that then becomes a free choice. Cutting Words, the other level three ability, has gotten a slight buff. Now you use your reaction after you know that an enemy has succeeded on their check. Then you can use your reaction to try to lower their check via your Bardic Inspiration die. Level 6 has a new ability, Cunning Inspiration, which allows your allies who benefit from your Bardic Inspiration to roll the die twice and use the higher. Additional Magical Secrets has been removed from the subclass, which I can understand, since the changes to Bard spellcasting 
gives them access to eventually to most of the spells in the game, making this less attractive. Instead, we have uh, another ability at level 10 that improves cutting words that inflicts psychic damage on the target, on the foe. And then the level 14 ability, Peerless Skill, which lets you convert a one of your failed skill checks into a possible success, has been buffed as well. You get to decide to use it after you know you've already failed on the check. And additionally, if it does not turn into a success, you don't have to sp actually spend that die. Next is the Ranger, and they get expertise for the first time since they're part of the experts class group. So at level one and then later at level nine, they get to choose two of their skills that they can double their proficiency bonus for. First, notably, a lot of the exploration focused abilities from the 5e Ranger are not here. The Hunter's Mark spell, which has been essential for Ranger build in 5e because it lets you use a bonus action to designate a foe as your quarry so that whenever you hit it, you do an extra 1d6 damage, is now uh, always prepared for you starting at level 1. And that's a new change in that Rangers starting at level 1 can now cast spells, including what has effectively become one of their signature abilities, Hunter's Mark. And Hunter's Mark is not counted against the limit of how many spells they can prepare. This is now what is called the Favored Enemy class feature. And additionally, Hunter's Mark no longer requires concentration, uh, giving rangers more flexibility in casting some powerful spells. Like bards, rangers are now prepared spellcasters and can choose different spells in the, every morning. And they get access to the primal spell list, every magical school of the primal spell list, with the exception of evocation. At level two, they gain a free fighting style. And notice I said free because fighting styles are can generally be picked as feats so long as you're in the warrior group. Rangers are an exception to that limitation. Even though they're not in the warrior group, they can choose fighting styles as feats, as feats. and they get one for free at level two. Then they get their subclass starting at level three. At level five, they still get an extra attack. At level seven, they now have they have some abilities now that uh, were essentially playtested in Tasha's Cauldron of Everything. Uh, first, at level 7, there is a Roving, which lets them have a climb speed and a swim speed and gives them plus 5 to their speed. But now that increase in speed has been increased to 10 feet. Also from Tasha's, at level 11, is Tireless, which has been changed somewhat. Uh, Instead of a daily number of uses, they get to every short rest, get temporary hit points that can be a cushion for their health and also reduce their exhaustion by one. At level 13 is another ability adapted from Tasha's, Nature's Veil, which lets them use a bonus action to become invisible until the end of their next turn. Uh, whereas before it was a number of uses per day, it is now spending a spell slot. At level 15, we get a new ability called Feral Senses, which gives the ranger blind sight uh, out to 30 feet. The capstone ability, Foe Slayer, has been lowered to level 18, and now it increases your Hunter's Mark extra damage from 1d6 to 1d10, to which I say meh, that's an extra average plus 2 damage, which at this level you'd expect something a little more significant, or more much more significant. Um, however, it's no longer limited to specific creature type groups, which by the way, favored enemy, um, being limited to specific creature types is no longer a thing for this ranger. Then at level 20, they get their epic boon. While recording, I forgot to talk about the featured ranger subclass, the hunter. Whereas in 5e, there were choices to make at every level it gave you a feature, here they sh took away the subpart choices and gave the more combat focused choices. The third level feature, Hunter's Prey, lets you do extra damage to an enemy who is already wounded. When you hit them, once per round, you can do an extra 1d8 damage. The sixth level feature, Hunter's Lore, makes it so that when you have Hunter's Mark on a foe, you also know their immunities, resistances, and vulnerabilities. The tenth level multi-attack feature allows you to cast Conjure Barrage, and it's always prepared. And this is very weak. It just gives you another spell that you could be preparing anyway. It essentially gives you an extra preparation slot, and that's all it does. The 14th level feature combines some abilities from the previous choices, and as a reaction, you get to have the damage that you receive and direct the other half if 
you can to an enemy that is next to you. Next is the Rogue, which Jeremy Crawford says in the interviews uh, has the highest reported level of satisfaction from surveys from players. And so he said that they did not want to tinker with it too much for that reason. And so there are fewer changes here. They still have expertise, which they now gain, get to choose two skills at level one and level seven. They have proficiency in simple weapons and martial weapons with the finesse property. So the f it's not clear what the fate of hand crossbows is, and it looks like they lose proficiency with long swords, which admittedly very few, few rogues did. Much is the same here, um, and I won't go over all the class features. They're kind of the same. And however, evasion has moved from level seven to level nine, I think to make room for another subclass ability at level six. Rogues no longer get blind sense, which made you aware of a creature within 10 feet. If you want to get that ability, you'd want to take the Skulker feat, which gives you blind sense out to 10 feet and some other abilities. At level 13, rogues get a new ability called Subtle Strike, which gives the rogue advantage against any enemy that is adjacent to one of the rogue's allies, making sneak attack easier to get from range. Slippery Mind now gives the rogue proficiency not only in wisdom saves, but also charisma saves, which makes sense given that there are some powerful mind control spells that target charisma. And Stroke of Luck is now not a capstone, but a level 18 ability. It's the ability that turns the rogue's failures into successes. Uh, significantly, though, the part of that ability that allowed you to turn a failed skill check into rolling a natural 20 on your die is now extended to all d20 tests. So if you fail a saving throw, you can say, I rolled a 20, or failed an attack roll, you can say you rolled a 20. Uh, this is still limited to once per short rest, however. The Thief subclass is presented here, and I thought it would have been buffed for combat, um, and I thought they should have, but it looks like they did not. Um, what we have here is that Fast Hands, the ability to do some things as a bonus action with your hands, um, they replace using an object as a bonus action with using the search action, a new defined ability or action in this game, uh, which I assume can be used to find hidden enemies uh, as a bonus action. Use an object, I'm not sure what the fate of that is. A lot of people were using potions as bonus actions as a house rule in their games, so maybe there will be changes there. Second story work gives a climb speed to the thief, which is kind of the same as before. They get to climb at no penalty to their speed. And now they get to use their dexterity when doing ability checks to jump. And jump is a defined action in this document also that includes a die roll. Supreme Sneak has been lowered from being ninth level to sixth level, and it's also been buffed. You don't longer have to walk half your speed while sneaking. Use Magic Device now allows the rogue to attune up to four items instead of the usual three. When using a magic item that has charges, there's a one in six chance it will not expend a charge. Pretty minor in my opinion. And instead of giving the ability to ignore class, race, and level requirements for magic items, it's now more confined and defined. They can use scrolls of up to level one spells for free. And for higher level scrolls, they need to do an arcana check. The Thief's Reflexes ability has been lowered from level 17 to level 14, and instead of having two turns in round one, it gives them the ability to use an extra bonus action, which must be a one of the bonus actions from their Cunning Action class feature. So dash, disengage, and hide. And they can do this a number of times per day, uh, equal to their proficiency bonus. Now we get the feats. In the first one D&D document, we were only given level one feats. We now get level four feats, all of which give plus one to an ability score. And the list we're given here rounds out what we're given in the first document so that we have nearly all the feats from the 5e player's handbook presented. A lot of the feats now have prerequisites that did not exist before. Some are limited to different class groups, like the fighting styles are limited to the warrior groups. Significantly, feats are still are in direct competition with ability score increases, uh, which is something I think they should move away from. Ability score increases are a feat, 
um, you can get a feat uh, that gives you plus two in one score or plus one in two different ability scores. And this makes sense given that feats are now core to the game. As for the feats themselves, there are too many changes to count. Um, and generally, a lot of the weaker, what have been considered weaker feats have been buffed. One example is Durable, which still gives you plus one to your constitution, but also now gives you advantage on death saving throws and allows you to spend a bonus action to roll one of your hit dice, so you spend the hit die, um, and gain that amount of hit points. There's definitely been that effort to balance the feats more against each other. However, it's rough in some places. Warcaster, for example, has been buffed, which has been considered an essential feat for many spellcaster optimization builds. That's the one that gives you advantage on those crucial concentration checks, uh, lets you use a spell as an opportunity attack, and also cast spells while your hands are full. Uh, now it does all those things, plus gives you plus one to your pro what's probably your spellcasting stat. It is a no-brainer pick compared to some of the other feats. There's also been cleaning up of language and preventing unintended interactions that have lived for eight years since the 5e player's handbook, um, such things like crossbow expert, which many spellcasters would take in order to nab the ability to avoid disadvantage on ranged attack rolls against an adjacent foe. Now that feat limits that part of the feat to crossbows. As I said before, fighting styles are now feats, so it's now possible to have more than one fighting style, and it's probably trivial to do so if you are one of the warrior classes. And then the epic boons, there are 13 of them, and they give you some showy ability. Uh, a lot of them have been adapted from the epic boons provided in the 5e Dungeon Master's Guide. I think they could use more work personally and make them um, more powerful. There's um, Epic Boon of Combat Prowess, which lets you convert a missed melee attack into a success, and you get to do that once every battle. You have to be in the Expert or Warrior group to choose that one. Another one, Epic Boon of Fortitude, gives you 40 extra hit points, and once per round, whenever you would gain hit points, you get to add your Constitution modifier. Epic Boon of Irresistible Offense, uh, available only to Experts and Warriors, lets you always ignore resistance to damage. Epic Boon of Skill Proficiency, which is available to all characters, makes you proficient in all skills. Next in the document are the spell lists, which list the spells from levels 1 to 9 this time for Arcane, Primal, and Divine spells. And these look like they cover all of the spells from the 5e Player's Handbook. Notably, some spells have changed their School of Magic, and my guess is that this is to make sure that in this case, rangers and bards have those spells that are intended for them. I, I imagine for other classes, this will be true as well. Lastly is the rules glossary, which gives a lot of definitions, and there's a lot of little nuggets that are significant to the game here, which I'll cover in my list of 20 things you might have missed. Now on to the main event, the 20 things you probably missed in the one d and document. I'm going to work from the front of the document towards the back, and I'm going to start with one thing um, that you probably know, and is therefore not part of the list, which is significant, which is that the changes to D20 tests and crit uh, critical hits from the first 1D&D document are no longer there. Uh, in the first document, natural ones always failed, natural 20s always succeeded, and enemies did not do critical hits, uh, and there were other important changes to critical hits. That's all not here. I will comment on that in my second video. The first thing you probably missed is, you probably didn't miss it, but you probably didn't realize it's a change. Um, it's that multi-classing is now core. Um, it says spelled out explicitly in every class description what multi-classing in that class gives you. It was a rule that most tables played with. What's significant here is that it was incorporated only as a variant rule in 5e and was therefore there was not much attention put to balancing it as a variant rule and now while making a new edition is this is their opportunity to balance it which is good news on the other hand i do have concerns that i will share in my second video Second is that all subclasses, as announced by Jerry May Crawford in his interviews, all subclasses give you features at levels 3, 6, 10, and 14. Now, why is this important? This means that 
subclasses that in the past have been seen as essential for optimization, looking at you, Hexblade, uh, level one Hexblade Warlock, um, are no longer available at first level. We have yet to see the design of the Warlock, but um, or of the other subclasses, but subclasses that give powerful abilities are no longer going to be available at level one. So this is going to rein in uh, powerful level dips, and it also shows some concern for balance uh, that Wizards of the Coast is applying to this new edition that I welcome. And I'm going to put on the record now that if Wizards puts out in 1 D&D a class that lets you add your charisma to your attack and damage weapon rolls, I'm going to... you're not going to hear the end of it from me. <laughs> Third thing you probably missed is that not only are... Uh, bards and rangers now prepared spellcasters, but there looks like there is a fundamental change in how spells are prepared. Cantrips, first of all, are no longer innate known spells that you are limited to for your adventuring career. You get to switch out your cantrips every morning during uh, morning preparation. So if you can cast three cantrips, you get to choose three cantrips and they can be different every morning. Uh, the other change is that the number of spells you can prepare now is not determined simply by your level plus your spellcasting modifier. It's the number of slots you have in each level. So uh, the tendency, for example, of some players to have lots of level one and level two spells because they're very powerful and are still useful at high level, they're now limited to, say, three or four. However, whatever the number of spell slots they have for that spell level. The fourth change that you probably missed is that the Bard's Jack of All Trades ability has been nerfed, and it is good that it's been nerfed. It was the ability that was gained at second level, now it's fifth level in 5e, that when you were not proficient in an ability check, the Bard could add half of their proficiency bonus to it. Not only has it been moved from second level to fifth level, but also it's no longer applicable to all ability checks. Uh, there was an unintended interaction in the 5e version where bards sometimes became the best at initiative or the best at counterspelling, which call for ability checks that don't add your proficiency bonus to them normally. And that has now been reined in. Uh, this new version, it limits it to skill checks. And this is a welcome change. The fifth change you probably missed is that Sneak Attack has gotten a significant nerf. This is also reining in what was possibly an unintended effect of the previous rule. Before, um, well, what it says now is that Sneak Attack uh, can be applied to an attack during your turn. And a lot of optimization builds in 5e consist of giving the rogue, having an ally give the rogue an action uh, or setting up an, an opportunity for the rogue to make a an attack outside of the rogue's turn and uh, apply their sneak attack damage to that. Or to use a cantrip like a booming blade and add your sneak attack damage to that spell's damage. That has been reined in. The sneak attack damage must be during the rogue's turn. This is causing some consternation um, about the rogue in some online discussions, and I'll talk about it in my second video. Six, uh, the fact that feats have new requirements um, close off a number of popular combinations that have existed in 5e optimization circles. Um, they require a minimum ability score, some of them, and Crossbow Expert and Sharpshooter, which have been popular feats uh, for many builds, including Spellcasters, now require that the character be proficient with a martial weapon. And we'll remember that bards are not proficient with any martial weapon anymore. The seventh thing you probably didn't notice is the Grappler feat. It's a kind of OP. It allows you to make an unarmed attack and grapple in addition to doing damage with that unarmed attack. And additionally, you get advantage on attack rolls against the creature you have grappled. Now, maybe this is part of an overall uh, effort to balance marshals. Uh, it's definitely a great boost to monks. But something hilarious is that you also are not slowed when you move a creature grappled by you. And I'm going to share a post and include a link in the video description um, 
that uh, describes the monk as the yoink class. Now the monk can fold them with a punch to the gut, then grapple and carry under an arm and use step of the wind and dash 100 plus feet off the map. Um, this is uh, uh, is prone to abuse. Um, and I'd like to see if it will be changed. The eighth thing you probably didn't notice is that uh, two feats that were considered essential for some builds because it increased your damage per round that allowed you to lower your attack bonus by five to get a bonus of 10 to your damage if you connected a hit. Um, that specific ability has been removed from them. And there has been some drama on the discussion boards. I will save my discussion on that for the second video. My hot take right now, though, is that I think uh, the freak out is premature. The ninth thing you probably didn't notice is that you can now much more easily switch weapons in the middle of battle because of the attack action now allowing you to equip or unequip one weapon before or after any attack that is made as part of your attack, uh, including uh, an attack that's simply an unarmed strike. So the problem that had existed earlier, where you were limited to interact having one interaction per turn with an object, uh, which made it hard to switch weapons, and also um, is now gone. And you can even do um, multiple attacks on a turn once you get the ability to do more attacks with different weapons. Next is that the Guidance cantrip has been nerfed, and it is a nerf I welcome. Uh, guidance is the cantrip that lets you add uh, a 1d4 to a skill check, and it was often spammed by many tables uh, for the whole day <laughs> for all checks, including even some DMs allowing it to happen in the middle of a negotiation with an NPC. I cast Guidance! Um, uh, that's been reined in by the fact that it is, uh, first of all, it's a reaction now. If a ally fails on a uh, skill check, but two, once it's used on the ally, that ally cannot benefit from this spell again from anyone casting it until um, after the next long rest. This is significant to me because this is one of several uh, changes I see in this document, which makes me think that they are going to make some efforts to balance the math. And I'll comment more on that in the second video. The 11th thing is that exhaustion has been completely changed. Instead of a hard to remember table of six stages of exhaustion, it's now just a flat penalty on all of your checks and also your spellcasting DCs. So it has a significant effect on you and it's easy to remember. And it also reminds me of some Pathfinder 2E conditions. It just gives you a number that you need to remember that is a encumbrance on key checks that are made. So uh, yeah, it will now affect exhaustion now has um, an effect on spellcasters that it might not have had before. It can go up to 10 and you can reduce it by one with a long rest. The 12th thing you probably didn't notice is that the help action uh, now requires that if you're going to help somebody with a skill check that you be proficient in the skill yourself. Um, before it was uh, possible to help uh, a wizard uh, on their magical research, even if you had no idea, no knowledge of magical research. So that has been reined in, and I think that's a good nerf. The 13th thing you probably didn't notice is that inspiration is now uh, something you can use after the roll is made. That is uh, something that uh, I've been suggesting uh, myself. I think it actually should be buffed a little more after you know the result of a roll. But yeah, there had been an effort in the first document to uh, um, make inspiration used more and for DMs to reward it more by having it come up automatically on a natural 20. And in one of my previous videos, I thought that the main reason was forgotten uh, was that it was lackluster. It was something that gave you advantage, which you could get by other means. And it also uh, might be wasted when you use it. Uh, well, you don't you're forced to use it before knowing whether you're going to succeed anyway. Um, and when you roll a success anyway, with that, it didn't affect, it feels bad. Uh, but now this means that you can roll the d20. It says immediately after rolling the d20. So I, I assume that means you don't know the result yet. Uh, you can decide to use inspiration, which is now named to heroic inspiration. And I'm not sure why. 
there's a reason for that. And also, it just gives you advantage. So if you had advantage on the original roll, it doesn't help you to use inspiration. I actually think uh, inspiration should be a just a pure reroll, um, uh, like the lucky feat in 5e, but not exactly like the lucky feat in 5e, one that is not does not feel broken. The 14th thing you probably missed is that rolling a natural one on a d20 test now gives you inspiration. And if you already have it, you can reward it to somebody else. So it's just like what was pre presented in the first document, except that instead of a natural 20 giving you inspiration, it's a natural one. Uh, this was something I suggested in uh, an earlier lawyer's critique video and something I had actually seen written online. Uh, yeah, I think this is an improvement. I'm still not sure about making inspiration more ubiquitous or, or advantage more ubiquitous, to be more precise. Uh, but um, it's a good change. Um, the 15th thing you probably missed is that it looks like the stealth rules are finally going to be revised and clarified. Uh, we now have in the glossary a definition for hidden. Uh, it's now defined, first of all, and it says that you can get this condition when you hide, which uh, um, in a heavily obscured area or when you have three fourths or better cover. So these uh, the stealth and hiding rules have been notoriously unclear and contradictory uh, in 5e. Uh, and uh, I'm glad this effort's being made. Uh, I think that the fact that hide uh, calls for a DC 15 stealth check, I question, however, it, that would be aut uh, automatically successful um, at a certain point by rogues or anyone with expertise. And uh, I figure why not uh, compare it to the perception DC of the monsters that you're trying to hide from. I also noticed that it is a condition inherent to the hiding creature, as in it's not relative to other creatures, which is strange. It means you're hidden to your allies. And so they uh, may need to clarify that um, in the future. My next change, uh, which is uh, two weapon fighting has been buffed. Uh, two weapon fighting before uh, required a bonus that you have a light weapon in each hand and that you use your bonus action uh, with one of those weapons. Um, and now it is simply folded in to um, if you're the light weapon property so that if you're wielding two light weapons, you can do that extra attack with one of the weapons. Uh, so long as as part of the same attack action, freeing up your bonus action. So this is going to lead to a lot more fun, I think, for dual weapon wielders. Uh, rogues can do their cunning action. Bards can do their bardic inspiration now. Uh, by the way, more things are reactions now uh, in this document uh, while still doing uh, while not being punished for being a dual wielder. The 17th thing that you probably didn't notice is that it looks like we are seeing the system of surprise um, in this new edition. Uh, in 5e, surprise was a condition you had um, that prevented you from acting uh, until your initiative came up. Uh, but now it, uh, it looks like uh, surprise is represented by conditions that either give you advantage in the case of being hidden or disadvantage on your initiative role in the case of being incapacitated. So there's probably more rules involved, but it looks like that's getting a revision. The 18th thing uh, that you probably did not notice is that it's no longer possible to run, uh, jump over a chasm and attack on the same turn. Um, I see what they're trying to do here with the new jump action that now has been defined, uh, where instead of you automatically uh, uh, jumping across a chasm, depending on your strength score, it now requires a roll. They also want to give uh, more use for your acrobatics or athletics skills. However, if you are using this action, which is required if you're jumping more than five feet, it uses your action. And that means you're not gonna be able to wail into somebody uh, after jumping across a gap, or I assume, and I don't think this was intended. I think this was honestly a mistake, is my guess. And I think that um, w there should be more uh, allowing things. Uh, if you're going to stick with the bonus action system, uh, action economy system, uh, this m 
should be uh, either just part of movement uh, or defined as a bonus action. The 19th thing you probably didn't notice is that if you're going to be using different speeds on your turn, such as land speed and climb speed or fly speed, those each require a different move, which, by the way, has a capital M <laughs> move, um, which is probably not your action, but you probably as part of your turn can move and then do an action and a bonus action on your turn. Um, but yes, you can also... Uh, dash lets you move again a second time on your turn, but if you're switching speed types, it says you have to use uh, a different move for each one. This is actually something from Pathfinder 2E, uh, but I'm not sure I like the consequences as much here uh, because it uses your dash action to have more than one speed type within 5e's action economy whereas in pathfinder 2e because you have three actions it's not as punishing where you can walk up to a ladder and then climb and then uh, punch somebody after climbing that ladder um here it uses your entire turn um and i am not sure that makes sense in this context but i do like the effort to uh clarify and maybe simplify also um adjudicating um different speed types at the table the 20th thing that you probably didn't notice is that uh, the rogue being able to have advantage uh, on any enemy that uh, is adjacent to one of the rogue's allies probably means we will not have the flanking variant rule that we had earlier that was popular at many tables. There needs to be some other solution uh, for flanking if this class ability is intact in order to protect the, the rogue's niche. So... What whether that it can't be advantage, maybe it could be a flat modifier of plus two if you are directly opposite um, your ally who is also adjacent to that same creature, which is also what's done in Pathfinder 2e. It's simple and clean and also gives value to positioning. Maybe that could be done, but uh, it looks like flanking um, as presented in the DMG as a variant rule is not going to stick around. OK, so. Those were my 20 things you probably didn't notice in my overview. Uh, if you enjoyed it, please do a like. Also subscribe to my channel and ring the bell uh, because you're going to want to see my second video where uh, I put on the critiquing hat and uh, talk about my overall thoughts on where uh, this edition, this new edition, sixth edition is going. So I hope you enjoyed the video. I will see you next time. Mm -hmm.